This podcast is sponsored by the Music Player Network at musicplayer.com, the premier musician resource for keyboard players and beyond. Since the year 2000, the Music Player Network has been the go-to source for news and views on music technology, playing tips, and gigging help. The Keyboard Corner is one of the longest-running keyboard forums in Internet history, with guitar, bass, drum, and numerous recording and music tech forums also on offer. Frequented by weekend warriors, manufacturers' representatives, and professionals alike, MPN provides an invaluable resource for any musician, and it's 100% free to sign up and use. Go to www.musicplayer.com to see for yourself. Hello and welcome to episode 4 of the Keyboard Chronicles, a podcast for keyboard players of the gigging variety. I'm your host, David Holloway, and it's great to be back again. Before I introduce this episode's guest, I just wanted to thank everyone who's provided feedback on the first three episodes of the show. So far, everyone seems to be enjoying the interviews, and with your feedback, they'll hopefully keep on getting better. So, yep, thank you. Uh, This episode, we have our first Canadian guest, a keyboard player from Edmonton, Alberta, who plays everything from funk to jazz metal. Eric Doucette's a very interesting guy to talk to, and he has a great story of someone passionate about what they do and how they keep on doing it. Enjoy! Eric, thanks so much for joining us. Um, you've got the extreme privilege of being our first Canadian guest on the show. Yeah, thanks, David. Thanks for the honour. <laughs> um, <laughs> now, look, it's great to have you here. And um, obviously, uh, we're forum mates on musicplayer.com, but uh, what made me invite you was actually just the range of stuff you do as a keyboard player. So I, I did mention in our in- introduction, but I'll just read it out briefly here again from your own bio. I mean, you're currently a keyboard player in a funk soul band, Carter and the Capitals, as well as founder and co-leader of an experimental band, High Tides, uh, fa- founder and musical director of a francophone cover band, uh, and keyboard- <laughs> keyboardist in a jazz metal band, Red Litmus, and also just on the side, and I like how you're self-deprecating, saying semi-competent singer, saxophonist, percussionist, sound engineer, and writer. So two quick questions <laughs> on this. One, how the hell do you find the time to do all that? And two, why should I not hate you for your obvious superior abilities? <laughs> oh, no, dude. Oh, wow. Thanks, David. Uh, well, um, yeah, thank you. Um, I mean, if, I guess the, the, the biggest thing is I uh, decided a while ago that I didn't want to have a day job. So I, that's where I get the time. Uh, I guess. Good move. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, and that's that sorts. I mean, in some ways, it's by necessity as well, right? It's just uh, you have to branch out and be... Um, flexible yeah. and uh, adaptable and be able to do all kinds of different things uh, to, to build a career. So, um, yeah. And um, and I suppose the, the obvious question resulting from all, all those projects you're involved with beyond how do you, do you fit it in is is how do you actually schedule this and, and make it all work for you? Mm, yeah, well, I think it, I find it's, um, it's actually interesting in terms of the sort of the waves of how the bands kind of, uh, work working in in ways where you know one band is busier and one band kind of slows down and everything and it, it kind of it kind of works together you know a, a tour schedules with one band and a record schedules with another band and and things just kind of mesh and flow together um, and you, you know at the same time I you know in a lot of ways I'm I'm working with people who are in in the same scene and everything too so even if there's a variety of um, of styles that I'm working with. There's still a lot of common musicians because, you know, it's, I mean, Edmonton isn't a massive city, so um, there's still a lot of uh, overlap within this, within the scenes and the styles. Yeah, no, that, that makes sense. And so, I mean, g- give us a little bit of a short history of your career in music so far. I think it's fair to say you're slightly younger than me, but I still think <laughs> you've got a pretty cool history. So you just give us a rundown of that. 
Sure. Well, I mean, uh, yeah. I, who who knows what age you are, David? So I mean, who, who knows? Well, but... <laughs> so, somewhere between forty nine and forty nine. <laughs> okay, but um, yeah, no. I mean, I, I I guess I started I started piano pretty young. Uh, officially, lessons at seven. Like uh, I'm the youngest in my family, so my 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 brothers were already all taking piano lessons, and uh, I actually I I wanted to start earlier, but my parents were sort of like, nah, it's. It's not worth it with the kid before seven, you know, can't, can't sit down and concentrate long enough for, yeah. for that. But so anyway, so I, so I eventually started with that, um, had, uh, you know, classical lessons, but, uh, a teacher who was still open to, you know, like jazz arrangements or, mu- you know, music from movies and things like that. And, uh, you know, scored out arrangements of pop songs and things like that. So I, I still have had a, a variety of styles covered, uh, even though everything was still sort of written out, uh, scored up, fully scored out arrangements. Um, but, um, yeah, just, uh, you know, and then growing up, I just listened to a lot of music as well. Uh, myself and my brothers listened to, uh, a wide variety of stuff. And obviously, you know, we each bought albums and then each passed them along to each other and everything. So we sort of, uh, <laughs> between the four of us covered a lot of ground. Um, and then from there, um, you know, just started playing in bands in high school. There was a great uh, kind of after-school rock band program at my at my high okay. school. Um, so it was a really great program where, um, you know, I got a band together with, with my friends in high school. And uh, for uh, an hour and a half after school, we'd, you know, be in this sort of rehearsal space with, uh, you know, fully equipped with the PA and, and, and amps and drum kit and uh, keyboard and stuff. And uh, with... Uh, sort of a teacher who is like a, you know, a local professional musician or something like that. So someone who can teach you about songwriting and stage performance and different things like that. Um, and then builds into a, a, like a battle of the bands at the end of the year. Yeah. Okay. So it's a really great program through high school. Um, that really helped me, you know, get, get performance, um, experience and get songwriting experience and, and play in different styles and things. And that built into, um, following actually following one of my brothers into uh, the the local college music program here uh so McEwen at the time was a college now it's become McEwen University um and uh so that's sort of the 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 jazz pop contemporary program here in town um and a pretty a pretty well respected program throughout sort of western Canada um uh, Canada, Canada wide really um uh yeah uh, uh just a, a great program that again covers a wide variety of styles um, and gets a lot of performance experience and um, really gets gets people playing. And because it's so integral to the scene, you often, if you're you know someone who's playing in in school, you can often transition to someone who plays in gigs and around town and everything. Yeah. So, um, so that's kind of you know the, the 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 basics of it. You know, I've I've you know through all those different places I've, I've had the, the chance to play, um, I guess, yeah, a, a fairly wide variety of styles. Mm-hmm. Like I can't, say I'm, I can't say I'm, you know, the, the best, you know, Latin piano player or anything like that, or, you know, there's, there's still, you know, plenty of things like I'm not, I'm not a great bebop player or anything like that. You know, there's all kinds of things that I still couldn't cover really well. And, you know, certainly my maybe classical chops aren't what they were when I maybe was 14, you know, but, yeah. uh, at the same time, um, yeah, I guess I've, uh, I've, I feel pretty comfortable covering uh, a fair amount of right, variety of things. Yeah. yeah, and yeah. I want to get onto the the jazz and, and funk in a minute, but just as going back to the rock band program at high school, do you, is there stuff you learned there, not so much technically, but as far as songs that you still uh, are playing today that you go, oh my God, I'm still playing these all these years later? I mean, yeah, it's uh, it, it certainly is funny like that. Uh, it's it's there's a lot of you know just basic basic lessons in terms of you know how to how to get the groove to work in a song or just you know how to put together a series of chords and not overthink it. You know things things like that um, that are just sort of basic fundamental things. Um, you know whether it's yeah you know paying attention to the the the, the kick and the bass pattern and things like that. Um, is that uh, that yeah are just uh, yeah fundamental and, and carry over through through all, all this. And what, what what's the Canadian version of um, 
Don't Stop Believing or in Australia it'd be a, a song called K San from Cold Chisel. What what's the stereotype that you're trying to avoid playing? <laughs> um I mean, I do, I, I do play "Don't Stop Believing" from time to time. <laughs> Don't uh, we all? You know? But <laughs> I mean, if we're talking about a, like, like, yeah, cl- classic songs. I mean, things like I mean, especially because I'm in Alberta, which is the West, which is the prairies. Oh yeah. Uh, there's definitely you know, fishing in the dark, a Cadillac Ranch, you know, kind of con- classic country songs like that. Um, but one song that I really hated playing, if we're talking about cover band songs that I hate playing, is. Um, uh, the uh, Black Eyed Peas uh, "Tonight's Gonna Be a Good Night" oh, yeah. okay. uh, song. <laughs> oh man, that that one is like you know takes the cake in terms of of when I play with the with the sort of cover band. It's yeah, no, it's that's the one I that's really the one hate. You're gritting your teeth through. Yeah, <laughs> it's just this just the most repetitive thing I've ever played, yeah. and it's just yeah, not interesting. There you go. But, interesting. And I like rep- I like repetitive music in a lot of ways, but. Yeah, not that. <laughs> and I, I think, and um, our last guest um, came from a real um, area of passion about jazz, and it, it seems to me that between jazz and I'm assuming with Carter and the Capitals, the funk soul side of things, that the, is that the area that you you have the particular passion for? Yeah, I would say um, yeah, often mostly drawn to yeah groove based music um you know like, like black american music uh uh in a lot of ways you know like everything from from jazz and blues and gospel through to, to funk and and soul and r&b and things and uh, a lot of hip hop as well um yeah you know and i mean there's you know even i mean even if we want to talk about country and and the, the those origins of of that music as well um you know there's yeah, like I would say, a lot of groove-based music, really, for sure. Yeah, and and so I don't want to get onto rigs quite yet, but I can imagine between those styles and the other stuff you do, you, you probably have some challenges in, in um, putting together a rig that, that services all of those, or do you find you're just swapping stuff in and out all the time? Yeah, well, it's funny. I mean, it's funny that we're doing this now because I am actually like sort of contemplating a massive rig change but <laughs> currently yeah i do have a few a few pieces that i sort of mix and match depending on the gig um my sort of my my mainstay thing that's been on you know 90 percent of gigs 90 percent of recordings that i've done since buying it uh i don't know eight or nine years ago is my nord electro three oh, yep. um, so yeah so the 73 key one and so yeah you know the three it's it's I think it's real. I mean, I've played a two before and I've played some of the newer ones as well, but I think the three was really a, a nice, and obviously I'm used to it, so I'm biased and everything, but I think it's a really nice, nice middle ground in terms of like, it has the, the Mellotron samples and things, and it has um, like a pretty decent um, organ engine and Leslie simulators. I mean, like obviously some people would disagree as well, but you know, it does the job yeah, for yeah. me. Um, and, uh, and it, but it's still very simple and immediate in terms of playability and everything, which is something that I really crave. Um, I, yeah, hate menus and everything. So the Nord is definitely, um, a big part of my rig. It has been for a long time. Um, otherwise, depending on if the Nord is on top or on bottom of my stand, because I usually play two keyboards, um, generally, um, I've had the, the Kurzweil SP6 for the past year uh, or so, maybe year and a half now. Um, so that usually goes on the bottom, like if I'm doing cover band gig, um, and that becomes kind of my main board, and then my Nord becomes more of just my org slash auxiliary board. And with uh, the, Kurz, the Kurzweil, are you in love? Or, uh, and I, I ask this as someone that's never owned a Kurzweil, so. Um, well, I've... I would I would say I I wouldn't say I'm in love no <laughs> I would say it, it, it does the job you yeah know? Um, it's you know it's the SP6 so it's not their flagship I'm sure if I you know had the Forte or yeah. um, I can't remember what the other better newer model is oh the PC4 that's about oh, to come yeah, yeah yeah but the, the sp6 like it's it, it's really good and it certainly is an uh i feel like it's an upgrade over the uh trivia the px5s that i had before which i also 
you know, quite enjoyed, loved, did a good job and everything, but ultimately wanted something else. Um, I think the same way the SB6, you know, it, it, I've had it, you know, for a year and a half, played plenty of gigs with it. Um, it's great. Um, in a lot of ways, it has a lot of great sounds. And I even, I have the, a few loaded sounds from, uh, Dave Weiser as well. Oh yeah. So those, um, those have helped kick it up a notch as well. You know, just a, a few more pianos, a few more, well, acoustic and electric pianos, um, a few more synth sounds and things like that. Um, just a, a bit of a wider sonic palette for that. Now, this is one of my blind spots, Eric, with Dave Wise. I hear his name come up all the time, and he's a legend with sounds. So, what, I mean, you, you may not know any more than I do, but what's the... I, I'm going to have a quick Google while we chat. Um, I know he do, he's an actual Kurzweil artist, isn't he? Well, yeah, I mean, he must be... have some sort of... I know he worked for Kurzweil in sort of R&D at yeah. some point. Um, now he has his own programming company. That's right. Yeah. Uh, so I don't know if he's like an endorsed Kurzweil. He is. So, so you know, th thanks to okay. me being <laughs> unorganized, I've just Googled it on the fly and he is. Okay. So I can imagine yeah. Dave Bryce, our, um, our guest from episode two, wanting to thump the table going, of course he is. But yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So he's a Boston based yeah. keyboard programmer. Gotcha. Yeah, no. So he's um, yeah, keyboard keyboard programmer to the stars. He's done you know all kinds of Broadway stuff and I have Who stuff. Uh, like actually, some of the sounds that I have in the SP6 are from uh, tours that he's programmed for the Who. Um, so that's pretty cool. That's damn cool. <laughs> you know, you, you pull up pull up a preset that uh, the Who was playing, or the Who were playing on stage. So um, yeah. that's not bad. Um, so yeah, the SP6 has been great. Like I I, I do enjoy. Um, like the uh, the fact that you can change the the response of the keyboard, the velocity response, and everything, because depending on the the actually depending on the volume of the gig, like with the the cover band that I play with, can be pretty loud sometimes. Yeah. So I want a lighter touch that I don't have to dig in too much to get to get some volume in there. But at the same time, when I'm playing a lower volume gig, and I want a bit more, you know, a bit more response, a bit more subtlety in the touch, then I can dial it back and uh, find a bit more of a middle ground. Um, so yeah, no, it's 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 a good keyboard. Like I said, I wouldn't be maybe in love with it, but again, it's sort of a bang for your buck kind of a choice, anyways. So yeah, you know, I think I don't think Chris was expecting anyone to you know fall head over heels for no, it either. No, no, that's right. That's for the flagships. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I noticed um, before we started recording today, you mentioned that you've got. Um, uh, 106. Do you know 106? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, do you still use that actively? I mean, that that's always been on my little bucket list. I would love to own one of them one day. Yeah, I mean, I uh, it's funny. I have actually gigged with it a few times recently. Um, it's not it's not generally in my sort of no. active roster, um, but I do pull it out from time to time. Um, it is a great sound. Like I definitely record with it for certain things, obviously, because it's sort of a, 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 a desired sound in yeah. a lot of ways, um, especially with the whole, you know, 80s revival that we've had in the last uh, 10, 10 or so years. Um, so, um, but uh, yeah, no, I mean, I, I it, it, that's, you know, it's part of, it's part of this whole rig redesign that I'm thinking of. And yeah, so I, I don't know if you read the thread on the forum that I started, but I, I, I I was asking about it and about potentially making it a more regular thing in the rig, which it has been at one time. I, like, I've toured with it and everything, and it's been good for me. But almost everyone responding in the thread was like, oh, you just you just got to sell that thing. Like, it's just, you know, as, you know, people are paying ridiculous prices for it. And, um, you know, it's it's only it's only going to break down on you and everything. And I'm like, yeah. ah. <laughs> I mean, it hasn't, but it will at some point. And and then I did look up prices, and they are actually even going for more than I yeah. thought they. Were. I knew they were inflated. Like I got mine for six hundred Canadian with the case, and I mean it's not cosmetically perfect, and it, you know, um, but it works. Um, and I looked them, I looked them up, and they're going for like over two grand, and I'm yeah, like, holy oh. like I mean, <laughs> it's just kind of crazy, but uh, but it is you know in the in the sort of, um, you know, uh, vision of a, some sort of a keyboard cave at some point where I could have yeah. some sort of 
project studio with all kinds of amazing keyboards that people really covet and things, obviously, even though, I mean, there still are plenty of 106s around and everything, but, uh, yeah. you know, it is those that maybe, you know, people walk in and go, oh, you have one. That's nice. right. And that that's when you do regret having sold it. You're yeah. absolutely right. Yeah. So, like, you know, it's, it's certainly like I could sell it and I certainly – you know, it would help me fund other things. Um, but at the same time, it's probably one of the last things that I would want to sell, you know, compared to selling, you know, a newer Kurzweil or, you know, even the, the Studio Logic Sledge or the Nord that, you know, that I've gigged up with a lot and with a lot of different projects and everything. There's still, you know, new digital keyboards that yeah. don't really hold the same, uh, uh, you know, a- aesthetic or yeah. uh, nostalgia nostalgic value you know so you yeah, know i'm hearing you and so i mean it sounds like they're, they're ignoring the the 106 for the moment the the other two are, are your go-to rig across your, your different projects and then how do you um how do you dial up your sounds how do you make it work for you live that it's as simple for you as possible or maybe not as simple as possible yeah i mean like i said with the nord um so yeah my sort of i guess my main three keyboards live are the north the the kurzweil and then the the studio logic sledge the sort of main synth that i use um and like i was saying with why i like why i like the electro 3 with the immediacy of the playability of the panel is really that i don't do a whole lot of programming like that's definitely one of my weaker points as a keyboard player and I mean, um, yeah, like, <laughs> I mean, I can do some and I've done some, you know, in terms of necessity, sometimes for certain gigs where you have to, you know, you're trying to replicate the sound of the record or yeah. whatever. Um, you know, there's some stuff that I certainly do find myself yeah, out of necessity doing, but for the most part, I really <laughs> mostly out of laziness, just, uh, just, uh, go for the, the most playable and immediate thing possible. Um, so like on my electro, I'm usually just in live mode. Um, yeah. on my, on my Kurtz while I try to save whatever sounds I'm using for whatever gig, like into the, the you know like the first into the either the, the five favorite buttons on the bottom or yeah. the the pads for the each section um so you know it's pretty it's pretty bare bones it's pretty simple the same thing the the sledge one of the lot one of the reasons i bought it one of the reasons i i like it um even though it's also one of the things that i'm considering selling right now um is the the big front panel um yeah. so you know it's it's mostly it's a pretty much one knob per function, one, one button per function type deal. Um, so I, you know, I can just reach and turn, change the filter frequency like that, you know, yeah. without, without having to worry about it. Um, and I mean, in terms, especially in terms of synthesis, in terms of like subtractive synthesis, I guess, um, that also speaks sometimes to maybe my um, my uh, inexperience or my uh, lack of knowledge with that, where sometimes maybe you dial up a sound and you change something and you're like, wait, that changed way more things than it yes. when I thought it would. Or, you know, I, I, all of a sudden I'm in a way different place than I thought I was going right. to be. Like, okay. I can just change the one knob back and it's, you know, it's fine. I'm, I'm uh, going to make the argument on that one though, Eric, that only some of the more really experienced synthesis um, can really know where they're getting into that territory because that happens to me all the time too. And, and like you, I tend to, to like my sounds nailed down before the show and they don't tend to change a lot. Yeah, of course, of course. And and maybe I'm maybe I'm a little skewed just by some of the rig uh, rig rundown videos that I've seen in the last while, you know, like I, I just watched actually, I mean, you were mentioning Dave Bryce and I just watched his interview with uh, Ian ben oh, of, yeah. the, of the Genesis uh, musical box um, and just some of that programming. And then the same thing with Jim Alfredson and his uh, Pink Floyd rig with the, yes. with the Kurt Forte there and just some of the stuff those guys are doing. And I mean, That's not incredible. to mention, you know, Matt Johnson and Jamiroquai and uh, Dave Bruno Mars is keyboard player. And, yeah. Those those people, you know, just uh, some some of what they do, and and I mean, obviously, those are, you know, fully built shows, and and you're you're going off studio tracks, and That's there's right. you know, in in some cases there's choreography involved, and everything's quite nailed down, and everything yes. precise and and whatnot, but. Uh, it's it's humbling to see those those oh, people. It's work definitely sure. humbling. I'm hearing you there. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, and in, in probably in relation to that, you just mentioned about, you know, th- um, sounds taking you into territory you're not expecting if you're tweaking them too much. What, what are the, some of the biggest lessons that you have learned as a player over the years that you've been gigging? In, in, specifically in terms of, of programming? Oh, I don't or... just anything. Just what are some of the things you go, I wish I'd known this 10 years ago? Oh, uh, I mean, one of the bigger things, I guess, um, is like actually practicing the material doesn't take that long <laughs> <laughs> if you just do it. Yeah. <laughs> And then everything, uh, and then everything feels a lot better and is a lot less stressful. <laughs> That's probably the biggest one I would say. Is like, yeah, not procrastinating uh, on practicing uh, helps a lot in the long run. Um, beyond that, uh, you know, m- m- metronome, how important the metronome is, okay. and how important you know, the rhythm and the groove is. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, yeah, how important the sense of time and everything like that. And then I guess in sense of time, punctuality, obviously also, yeah. uh, punctuality, reliability and all those things, you know, how, how, uh, how much that can impact the callback more so than the, the way you actually play the music. <laughs> True. Yeah. It's you know, that fit with the group. Yeah. 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 You know, and, uh, yeah. And obviously, in relation to that, obviously, attitude and all, all that other stuff, you know. And, but, yeah, just how, how the, uh, the non-musical things, how it can impact. Um, I mean, both the experience, because, you know, bad vibes can impact the, the, the music itself. But um, also just, uh, yeah, how un- lack of professionalism can uh, impact yes. whether or not you get, you get called back for another gig, that's, that's for sure. Right. And, and yeah. I mean, as you said, you, you're now doing this as a, as a full-time thing. So for you, the callbacks are, are critical. And so do you find you are ac- a- actively having to chase that work? I mean, I imagine you do. That's a full-time job. Yeah, I mean, uh, here and there, like, I guess I, I probably don't don't right now quite as much as I used to. Um, you know, like when, when you're in school and you're kind of coming out of school and everything and you're, and you're trying to get the ball rolling and then you're maybe – you know, hustling a little bit more and, and, you know, trying to hand out business cards or post your website or things yeah. like that. Um, you know, in terms of now, like I've, I've sort of gotten to a rhythm with certain things and there are, you know, certain gigs that I've played, you know, year over year or, um, different things like that. And then I've also, you know, lined up different teaching things and, uh, recording things, things like that, that are a little more sustainable. Yeah. Um, um, so yeah, so that there's a little less, I mean, there's obviously still has plenty of ebb and flow, but so there's maybe a little more, more controlled uh, ebb and flow. Yeah. Good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and we all have more than one thing, but what's one thing that you wish you could do better as a keyboard player? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, Ooh. I've got about 4,000, but you know, yeah. <laughs> I mean, um, I think, yeah, I think programming would be actually a, a probably a, a, a skill that I should develop more. Um, um, I, well, okay, let's say, well, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm just going to go off on myself and, and name more than one thing here, but yeah. programming, um, you know, yeah, just being able to, 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 to put those sounds together and put, put a show together and be more efficient with it also when I'm doing it. Okay. So that I can do it a little quicker and everything like that. Um, be a little more confident in those abilities, but also uh, background harmony vocals. Oh yeah, uh, you know I I do them. I do sing a little bit on certain gigs and stuff, and I'm 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 somewhat confident. Um, but uh, you know it could always be better for sure, and that's certainly in terms of yeah. If we're talking about employability and uh, yeah, in a land in a land dominated in a lot of ways by country music, also um, you know harmony vocals are super important. Yeah. Uh, and then also you know playing in a in a funk soul band, but also you know all, all that stuff. So um, yeah, har- harmony vocals, programming. Yeah. And always working on time, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, great ones. So it's never going to be good enough. It's uh, yeah. And you've rat- rattled off some great names there as far as keyboard rig tours, but who who were your keyboard player inspirations who gets you going and, and makes you want to get even better Ooh, uh 
Yeah. Um, I mean, there's a few, obviously, great, great players. You know, uh, Ray, Ray Charles is mm. a big inspiration. Um, Matt Rawlings is a, a really uh, amazing player who's, yeah, been a big inspiration the last few years. Um, Nigel Hall uh, is also, and, and, and John Cleary, I guess they also actually play together often. But, um, but yeah, both Nigel Hall and John Cleary have been big inspirations as well. Um, yeah, uh, actually a lot of New Orleans players like Professor Longhair and James Booker as well. Um, and, you know, everyone going going through that lineage to today and everything. Um, yeah, yeah, so many. I mean, a lot of a lot of sort of more contemporary jazz as well, like like Aaron Parks um, or Shy Maestro um, or uh, Tigran Hamasian and, and players like that. Um, you know, Espion Svensson. I mean, yeah. Um, no shortage. No shortage of inspirations. And that's yeah, not, that's you know, one of the things nowadays with with streaming and everything. Just we all have so much access. It's actually hard to nail down even a, a handful of people that yeah, these are the go to guys that make me want to be better because there's just so many of them. Yeah, no, for sure. I definitely feel that. I mean, yeah, um, as as someone who you know grew up. I mean, I grew up sort of in the, was born in the transition into CDs and sort of my whole childhood was CDs, but sort of you know, Napster and everything happened probably when I was like nine or 10 yeah. years old, you know, and uh, file sharing and then, you know, online stores like iTunes and then streaming. That's been sort of my whole life and YouTube and everything. So for sure. Um, and like I said, right from the start, mixing music just with my brothers and everything. Um, I, I definitely feel like there's just there's so much stuff um, out there that it's 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 definitely almost overwhelming sometimes. Yeah. But Absolutely. It's also it's also amazing, you know. It's it's uh, it's something to be grateful for, um, just to be able to. to th I mean, thinking about say Ray Charles, I feel like I've already probably heard a wider variety, like a wider variety of music than Ray heard in oh, his yeah. life. You know, I mean, obviously he had clocked more hours than I have at this point, but uh, in terms of what I've been exposed to, thanks to. YouTube and, and iTunes and streaming and all that other stuff. Um, it's pretty crazy. And as you said, it, it can be overwhelming, and the same applies on the tech front. I mean, you mentioned that you are just looking at doing some upgrading of your rig. What what information have you got that you're looking at? Maybe this is where I need to go. What, what's got you excited potentially for you on the tech front? Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, well, in terms of my rig, like I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about different things, and I'm, I'm sort of budgeting different things, and I, I feel like I am gonna have to wait until NAM to at least see what's yeah. announced there. Um, but I'm, I'm thinking about. So my first plan was trying to sort of um, bring my, my Carter and the Capitals rig to another level sonically. Yeah. Um, but right now it's the the nord with the sledge and it, it's a great rig and everything um but i the sledge sometimes just again it, i it's sort of a bang for your buck kind of a choice um and it's done me done me well and everything but it, you know it does sound a little a little digital a little cheap at times yeah. um you know and again maybe that's also a reflection of my programming um, and I think also probably if I maybe, um, you know, put a few stop boxes in, into the, into the line as well, that might help. But at the same time, I'm just like, uh, maybe I should look at, at, at improving the, the sonics of the rig. So I was thinking about, I already have this Juno 106, um, which is a big sound in a few yeah. of the, a few of our tracks, um, especially actually like one of our one of our bigger singles um and uh, so i was like okay well i have this and then uh you know i really had been looking at the dave smith ob6 yeah because we we do play a lot of prince covers and sort of have a bit of a minneapolis uh influence um from the you know minneapolis st paul yeah. sound and stuff. um so you know the, the ob is just so essential to that kind of stuff um, but obviously the OB6 is <laughs> a little expensive. Yeah. So I was looking at maybe the module and I was thinking, you know, maybe I could have, okay, the Juno on top of the Electro, 
with the Juno MIDI to the OB6 module, um, and I've already got a Key Largo as well. Oh, yeah. I could put three of them through the Key Largo to the house and have my monitor on stage with me. I already have a, I already run an EV um, powered uh, monitor on stage. Um, so I was thinking about that, and then, like I said, I posted on, on the forum sort of proposing this and then also asking about maybe down the line could I find like some sort of solution to having the OB MIDI to both my Juno and the Electro so that then I could be running either two synth sounds at the same time or an Electro and, you know, one of either two or whatever and just sort of mix and match um, sounds and be a little more flexible like that. Um, and then that's when everyone sort of went, ah, you should just sell the Juno, just get the, just get the OB6 with the keyboard, you know, that's, that's just, that's really what you want and everything. I'm like, ah, I don't know. And then someone posted, well, Rudy, um, posted, uh, you should really just get a stage three oh, with, yeah. an, with an OB6. And I went, yeah, I mean, I know. <laughs> yeah, it just, it's, it's about, they're not cheap. Exactly, you know, it's like it's like ah, uh, yeah, I've been I've been lying to myself that I don't want that rig, but I I really do want that rig yeah. actually, but it's just uh, yeah, it's pretty expensive. So now I'm sort of considering yeah, okay, could I sort of sell almost everything and go for that? Could you know, or should I sort of go with my original plan and the electro with the Juno and the OB6 module, you know, or should I go for something entirely different and, you know, maybe try to find, you know, another more modern synth, say like a, like a core prologue or, or, you know, I don't know, um, maybe a, a DSI rev two or something like that, yeah, yeah, yeah. um, with the OB six module and something, you know, all these different things. And, uh, you know, I'm also long-term thinking about replacing the, the Nord as well. Um, cause I mean, it's still performing admirably, admirably and everything. And, uh, it's still, like I said, a mainstay in most gigs, um, but uh, at some point it'll have to be replaced. Um, and, and you find all this stuff, uh, yes, stressful because, in, particularly when you're relying on this stuff full time. But you also find this is one of the best parts of um, the period where you're leading up to changing your rig and, and investigating all the options, and, and at least in your head, believing that you, they're all an option for you until you choose which one <laughs> and yeah. until you see the money. Yeah, yeah, totally. It's it's definitely exciting. It's definitely like, it's uh, it's the the positive part of the gas syndrome. Yeah. I guess it's the it's the, the the feeling like okay, no, we're actually we're actually gonna do something here. This isn't just you know pipe dreams and stuff. Right. It's just just figuring out what's actually possible and and what combination of things. And so then it is really like. Um, another sort of higher level of uh, of thinking and an activity and stuff like I, I did I pulled out you know and and drew a signal flow chart and everything of, of a possible rig and stuff and you know you're pricing out components and things and uh, you know thinking about all the different gigs that you might play with it and uh, you know a lot of people were talking about sort of setup time and you know weight and things like that and obviously those are considerations um, yeah but at the same time. Um, as someone, as uh, I think it's Sam who brought this up, who was saying that, uh, you know, it's like when you're when you're coming up with, you know, the rig for the band, you know, there's, you know, there's obviously there's all kinds of different projects and there's all kinds of different rigs. But it's really like when it's your, you know, creative band and it's the thing that you you're really putting your energy and your time into you want to you know play something that's really inspiring that's right. and something something that really reflects the the work that you put into this to the music you know and you want the sounds to be on the same level so it, you know you do have to weigh all those all those things and uh and and put them all together into hopefully a rig that uh works really well for yeah, all that that's right and I mean, weight, weight, and portability incredibly important. But you're right. If you're still, if you're sitting in a rig that's a decent weight to lug in and, and has been nice and portable as well, but you, yeah. you're not having fun playing, well, then you've defeated the purpose, really. Yeah, and I mean, most most things nowadays. I mean, as much as yeah, there's some heavy gear, and I've I've you know I've got some heavy stuff and everything too. At the same time, it's like you know when when i lift my roads or you know i i don't i don't gig my my hammond m3 but i i have moved it a few times i and i have gigged my roads a few times and even and toured with it a little bit um and that's when you're like oh yeah 
you know, I could imagine moving this stuff, you know, <laughs> a Hammond and a Rhodes and a Clavin and yeah, Leslie yeah, yeah. Know, you every did. night, you know, I don't, I don't think so, you yeah. know, so, you know, I, I, we, you know, it's a, it's another one of those things where it's like, yeah, it's maybe there are, there's some uh, level of overwhelming choice, but at the same time, there's so many, so many great options That's and right. uh, everything really is going to do a, a pretty good job, but it's just about finding the best fit. So to me, it seems like you need a road trip um, south to Nam. <laughs> that would be nice. Yeah, I do have a few friends who've gone before, just with you know retail jobs and things at music stores. Uh, and I've I've thought about it. I I've, I have uh, considered taking a taking the trip down there. Maybe next year. I know I know you're going this year, right? Eh? I am like yeah, first and probably only time. Yeah, a bit excited, but um, yeah, it, it, I, part of it is to actually get all those manufacturers in the one place and actually test out some of the stuff for the future. Yeah, it's a great opportunity. Yeah, yeah, and I mean I don't know what it's like in Australia, but definitely here. I mean there's. There's a pretty good selection in in, in certain stores and yeah. stuff, but at the same time, there's there's a lot of stuff that you just you just don't see. That's right. You know, you just don't get a chance to put your hands on it, and so it would be just yeah, that'd be so cool. Yeah, and I mean, back to the music front. So you, you've got no shortage of stuff you're doing, but what in the near future? What are the projects you've got coming up that got you particularly excited? Yeah, well, I mean, there's a bit of uh, there's a bit of recording coming up. Like Red Litmus is going to be doing some stuff. Um, right, and let's, let's talk about Red Litmus just for a sec. Define, oh, sure. And I, I hate asking people to define genres, <laughs> but define define jazz metal for me. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's a project. So it's mostly the guitar player and the drummer's project. Like I'm sort of uh, it, it's a band, but I'm yeah. you know I'm not a founder of it in the same way. Um, and these two guys both played in a prog metal band before. Um, so very, very technical, uh, heavy music. Um, but, uh, the drummer actually, he was already in jazz school and then the guitar player okay. now had, now is in jazz school himself. Um, so they've, they both sort of transitioned and they both still play heavy music as well. Like the drummer plays a lot of like hardcore and different other things. Yeah. Um, but this is sort of, uh, a halfway project between both so yeah. there's there's you know there's heavier riff sections where we're playing big unison lines and things um there's improvisation and solos gotcha. and stuff um there's more sort of groovy parts there's more sort of spacey ambient parts as well um and there's a lot of odd time signatures <laughs> that's for sure <laughs> so, so metal ambiance and jazz feel sort of thing yeah, yeah, it's uh, yeah, like metal, metal composition and improvisation yeah. and, and interaction, you know. Yeah, yeah. Cool. yeah. Uh, and obviously, Carter and the Capitals is. Would it be fair to say that's your uh, busiest gig? And I mean, I know you guys are touring quite a bit uh, in Canada and stuff. Yeah, that's sort of the main main project right now. It's uh, it's definitely like we yeah we put out our our full length record this spring from debut full length um been been going for a few years now but just put out a few singles before the before the record actually came out in the spring um and yeah just been sort of touring for the last few years um mostly western canada we we did eastern canada as well after the, after the album uh, came out so oh, yeah. um just been uh, yeah just been trying to try, trying to build build a project like that um both through touring and, and, and online and stuff. And uh, I'm just going to continue to, to write and record music. And, uh, yeah, we're looking at probably recording some new stuff this this winter um, and just doing some maybe some more video work as well, you know, because, I mean, that's that's a lot of that's a lot yeah. of, sort of modern thing, right, is um, Instagram and, and YouTube and stuff. And so we're just going to be sort of developing a lot of, of um, multimedia content in that way. Um because we have toured a lot and and sort of built up a certain organic audience that yeah. way, um, and and now we're going to try to try to branch out a bit further, um, and uh, yeah, see see sort of what we can do with those, and then you know, and that also sort of sets the sets the table for for new recordings when those That's eventually right. come as well. Too, and so. I, I do recommend listeners um, check out um, Carter and Capitals, and I will link to it in the in the show notes. Yeah, I just I love the the feel and groove of you guys it's it's always a pleasure every time I, I see a link to some new stuff it's always an absolute pleasure to watch thanks um, so and then 
we always finish off with the cliche. Um, five desert island discs. What are, what are five albums, if they were the only uh, ones you could take, you would take to a desert island? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and I knew this one was coming too. Yeah, everyone stresses. <laughs> I, I would stress. Yeah, and, uh, and I did, I, since I knew it was coming, I did think about it a little bit so I wouldn't be too much on the spot. But again, it's just one of those things. Yeah. I mean, I'm not, I'm already not someone who likes to sort of name favorites, whether That's it's, right. you know, you're talking, you know, ice cream flavor or color or whatever it is. Um, but, uh, and I, I already recall a few years ago having trouble coming up with 25 <laughs> you know, discs yeah, for, I understand uh, that. for influential albums sort of uh, thing that was going around on Facebook a few years ago. Um, but I, you know, yeah. So, I mean, the caveat that obviously, I feel like all of these albums could be easily replaced with another, yeah. you know, similar style thing. You know, like I'm going to name, for example, my first one I'm going to name would be um, Gently Disturbed by the Avishai Cohen Trio. Okay. But for a long time, I was thinking I would probably actually name Aaron Parks as Invisible Cinema, but they're sort of interchangeable. So uh, it's one of those things where each one of these records I could probably sub it out yeah. for another one you know <laughs> i mean <laughs> okay so yeah i mean uh gently disturbed abishai cohen trio um jean le doux uh la vallée des réputations which is a uh, quebecois um folk folk rock uh album okay um, and i might get uh, you to send me in a message the the uh, the spelling of oh, that because i sure, know we get a lot of interest yeah. in people checking out new music so and um, yeah, unlike you yeah. i'm not bilingual when we didn't actually get into that but you're obviously bilingual which is another great yeah episode. yeah i'm i'm uh, fully fully fluent in french yeah um as uh, as uh, you know the canadian stereotype may be um <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh so yeah so let me, i got uh I got Abishai Cohen, um, and I got Jean Ledoux, um, and I'll name also uh, Chromio Fancy Footwork. Oh, yeah. um, I'll name um, Lettuce Rage, and actually, I think I might I might call an audible on my other one. <laughs> Again, <laughs> it's hard. <laughs> I had another thing picked, but I think I'm just going to have to, yeah, last second change it to uh, the uh, John Cleary uh, and the Absolute Monster Gentleman Mohippa Live, which okay. was actually recorded live in Australia. Oh, there you go. Yeah, yeah. But uh, what an amazing, amazing live album that is. I'll be checking that one out. And just, I mean, you're mentioning Australia and... Um... In Australia, like Canada, we have huge music scenes. So Canada has an extremely, you know, diverse and impressive music scene, and and as do we here in Australia. But outside of our countries, it doesn't tend to be well recognised. So I mean, the, the stereotypes, for example, with Canada is obviously people might know Celine Dion or Brian Adams. Yeah. Uh, and, yeah. and sorry, this is also taken from the perspective of a, a tragic rock weekend warrior like me. But I mean, <laughs> I mean, it's only once you know getting to know Canadians. In Canada, the tragically hip, I mean, obviously, and very sadly, no longer together, but uh, mm -hmm. are an iconic band in Canada. But outside of Canada, I'm not sure about in the US, are, are barely known. It's, mm. it's just a fascinating thing about how there's all this great music, but it doesn't, t it tends to be still US and UK very much yeah. dominating. Yeah, no, for sure. It's it's definitely interesting. Like you can have bands like, and, and I'm sure there are plenty of Australian bands that you could name that I wouldn't know at all. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, uh, and in the same way, I mean, there are bands like here who tour, you know, arenas in Canada and tour, you know, 500 person clubs in the States or That's whatever. Right. Um, you know, or the same way I have, I have, you know, friends and bands here who are, you know, maybe a few steps ahead of us or whatever, and who say, you know, have back to back sold out shows, uh, here in Edmonton and, you know, sold out album release shows in Vancouver and Toronto and stuff. And and uh everything or whatever and then go to the states and they're playing to like 15 or 20 yes. people you know <laughs> it's like it can it can definitely be hard but uh, at the same time it's uh it is it's one of those things where it's yeah it's you have your you know your bigger worldwide music industry and then you have your national 
industry and then you have your you know your you know local or provincial or state or whatever um and your municipal you know super local uh industry and everything and i guess you know yeah you just sort of find find your niche in different ways and see how how far you can go that's right or how far you want to go depending on <laughs> what that is too exactly but i mean yeah. i think it's fair to say standing outside looking at the work you're doing you've definitely found more than one niche and um a lot of it is very universal in its appeal so i, I think you're going to have a a very successful career as a musician whether that's you know getting food on the table each day or playing arenas in australia who knows but <laughs> all i know it's been a pleasure having you on yeah one can hope well thank you so much david A huge thanks to Eric Doucette for his time for that interview. It was great talking to someone that, again, is so passionate about what they do and does it in such a diverse way. So that wraps up episode four. Um, episode five, we have someone a little bit more local to myself in Australia. Um, we talked to someone who has the enviable gig of covering one of the greatest bands in the world and getting to travel around this great big nation, Australia, while he does it. So more on that next episode. In the meantime, if you'd like to get in touch, there's a couple of ways you can do that. So our website is www.keyboardchronicles.com. We're on Facebook at The Keyboard Chronicles and on Twitter at The Keyboard CHR1. If you'd like good old-fashioned email like me, then drop us a line at editor at keyboardchronicles.com. Thanks so much again for listening and hope to see you back here next episode. Mm -hmm.